Chapter 13, Investor Behavior and Capital Market Efficiency. So in this chapter, the key learning is around alpha. So far we've seen beta, but we're gonna take one big takeaway in this chapter and that's all about stocks alpha. To quickly recap, the alpha is the distance of a stock from the capital market line. So this is the green line, it's the capital market line where you can plot beta on the x-axis, expected return on the y-axis. And we've seen all of this in the previous videos. But a positive alpha is a stock where it, it lies actually on top of the green line. In this example, Intel is an example of a positive alpha stock. So it, it, has, it lies above the capital market line. And Coke is an example of a negative alpha stock. So, from capital market, um, from the CAPM model, capital asset pricing model, what we have seen is that all stocks actually fall on this green line. But then the question is, when does a stock not fall on the green line? So that happens when there's new information. So when there's new information in the market, a stock either becomes overvaluable or undervaluable. And alpha is what causes, it's, it's, it's what measures whether um, the stock is more valuable or less valuable than the information available openly out there. So for example, if Intel uh, is gonna be taken over by some company, then the person or the entities that know this information have a positive alpha over Intel because Intel stock would appreciate. So in a sense, alpha is the excess return, right? So expected return minus the required return. So if you know the Intel is supposed to give you 10%, which is here, but if it gives you 20, then, then that is the stock's alpha, which is expected return is 20 minus required return is 10. So the alpha is 10%. So alpha is basically, you can generate alpha if you have information that not everyone else has. And so then the central topic of this chapter is going to be, is there going to be an alpha given cap, cap M? We've learned cap M that market is efficient, that every stock lies on this green line. But then what explains, is there a possibility of an alpha? So the answer is yes. And let's get into why is that the case? So temporarily, Markets do become inefficient is what I feel based on reading this chapter. So the efficient portfolio could be here, but with this new information, the efficient portfolio actually becomes here. Uh, we've seen efficient portfolio creation in the previous videos, but basically it tells us what is the best return for the unit of risk that an investor takes. And, and that return the, over the risk actually changes when there's new information. So if, if someone can establish a positive alpha, then in, can, they can identify a stock with a positive alpha, then what happens is they'll stop selling that and they'll actually start buying that stock. So when people identify these positive alpha stocks, their stock price actually increase. And they, eventually there's gonna be stock pressure on selling, on, on buying because there's gonna be more buyers, less sellers. So the price increases, the yield reduces. And un until and unless the alpha actually becomes zero over time. So even if there is positive alpha, it actually becomes zero because it, there's price discovery. And remember market portfolio is alpha is equal zero. So the key assumption of cap M that we've seen in the previous video is that information is homogeneous, that everyone has this information, but here for alpha, you need to have asymmetric information, information that you have that others don't have that's so why you benefit investing early. And investors are rational in their expectations, right? That's the second big assumption of CAPM, um, that they correctly interpret the information that they have and they care only about two things, return and reduction in risk. But these are very, very strong, very strong assumptions that CAPM has, right? Um, so that's why we're gonna be challenging whether CAPM assumptions hold, is information actually homogeneous? And if, if if it is homogeneous, then there's no question of alpha. So the best way you can guarantee that uh, active fund managers actually don't take advantage of you 
is by holding a market portfolio. Because when you hold a market portfolio, you, you're guaranteed to get a zero alpha. But at least you will not get a negative alpha. And what I learned in this chapter is that a lot of investors actually earn a negative alpha, meaning they underperform the basic stock market index. So buying and holding index actually is the best strategy for most people in the market. So then the question is, does alpha actually exist? Is there a way to actually beat the index? If there is alpha, you can actually beat the index. And that means the market is not uh, efficient. And so the short answer is no, the alpha actually doesn't exist. I did say yes, and that's why I have an asterisk, right? For most investors, alpha doesn't exist because data and research suggests that people actually don't have a lot of asymmetric information, the information is out there, and there is no alpha to be generated. But there's an asterisk here because there are some people who can generate alpha, and that's what we're gonna look at. How are we gonna, what, what explains that? So that's what we're gonna look into this. But let's first look at why alpha actually doesn't exist for most of the individual investors, right? And so there are, there are these 10 behaviors, human behaviors, that cause individual investors to not have alpha. And so you're gonna go through each one of those 10 one by one, but basically, typically investors, they don't properly diversify, right? They, they actually either too long on one asset, like um, a home, too short on, let's say, uh, fixed income, like bond, too long on stock, right? So they're not properly diversified. So then they hold diversifiable risk which ideally you shouldn't have. So that's the big reason why people don't have alpha. First, they don't even, basically, they don't even diversify correctly. So that's the first thing. Second is they, they, are, they are inundated with biases, right? Like familiarity bias is one big one, where they invest in companies they know about, the products that they know about. So they think that that's the best product, but that actually may not be true and may not be representative. Relative wealth bias is hurting. People um, copy each other, right? And they want to beat the benchmark. They want to beat certain, beat certain friends that they have. And so basically that biases them to take unnecessary action. They trade too much. So excessive trading where they actually lose a lot of money in fees and the bid ask spread differences. So that overconfidence, right? That, hey, I have information that is uh, much better, so I'm actually going to be trading this. So more than 50% feel that they have uh, information that's better than average. But that typically just doesn't make sense, right? If it's more than 50%, then they can't be better than average. Any case, people trade a lot. They have hurting related relative wealth biases that they tend to compare each other. Um, men specifically, there's they underperform women uh, because of sensation-seeking biases and they, they tend to take on more risk than they should. And so their performance actually is much poor. This position effect uh, is, is another um, major reason why individuals don't tend to create alpha. From pros prospect theory, what we know is that people actually hold on to their loss-making stocks more than their winning stocks. They sell them quite quickly, the winning stocks, and then they hold on because they are reluctant to take mistake, admit mistakes. Why? Because, um, because of, because of framing effect, right? They they actually are uh, willing to take on too much risk, because they believe that you know they the stock is going to turn around, and and to the extent that they are twice as likely to realize gains, meaning sell the winners, than to realize losers. So admitting mistake is is pretty difficult, and people take risks based on where they are, if they're losing money. So, and also the fact that people, most people do investment part-time. They don't invest as a full-time investor, so they have limited attention. They can't really act on news as quickly as full-time investors and fund managers. They invest based on their mood. If there's a good mood, then they take on higher risky investment. They take on investment based on their personal experiences and their biases compared to actual events, right? If you buy a product and you like it, you just invest in that company. That's not how it works. Even like simple things like diversification, typically a uh, 2004 study based on the chapter suggests there's only four, four stocks for majority of the 
people and 401ks are also highly like concentrated so they're not diversified so there's so many of such biases where people tend to copy there's herd behavior they copy old winning fund managers so there's cascade information so there's 10 big reasons why it's very difficult for individual investors to to create a positive alpha uh, and so when when this this happens that means that there are people who are actually losing money because of these 10 pitfalls that they all have and so then that's what these sophisticated active fund managers they take advantage of this they actually can generate a positive alpha very few of them consistently because of these 10 drawbacks that most investors have so that's the asterisk so then is the market portfolio efficient that's the real question right cap m is going to assume that the market is efficient um, and that there is no positive alpha available but we just saw that hey there are these 10 big reasons why there's bound to be positive alpha opportunities available and so we can that challenge of whether the market portfolio is efficient um, becomes even more stronger if we can figure out if the mistakes that most of these individual investors make are pervasive meaning a lot of people have either five or six or 10 of these, each of these issues that are listed above. If so, if it's a pervasive and persistent set of mistakes that people are making, then there's they're gonna be incurring a negative alpha, meaning they're gonna be underperforming the index. And so if that happens and if there's limited competition, meaning there are few people who are actually trying to actively manage uh, and they have the skill, then with less inten intense competition, persistent mistakes by majority of people and pervasive, meaning there's typically a lot of people making this mistake, then yes, you can challenge that market actually is maybe not even inefficient, efficient, and that there is lots of positive alphas available out there. So so then how do people today generate positive alpha? What actually, this may be like questionable, meaning they think that they generate a positive alpha, but they may not be. So what are the three big ways? So the biggest one is if you have a information around like a company is going to be taken over, then that's inside information or you have certain skill to predict which m and activity is going to go through. That is the best predictor for uh, a positive alpha because the company that's getting bought will actually be bought at a premium. So their stock price actually goes through uh, and appreciates uh, quite significantly. And then we have Jim Cramer with Mad Money and there's so many such stock recommendation um, um channels and so many people trying to recommend stocks so they there is some evidence that hey uh that they do generate some positive alpha but very very limited and most people actually lose money active fund managers actually same same situation they they don't really generate alpha they think that they do but now we have data that suggests that uh, even if you have uh, a really good fund manager uh, as their size increases the probability of actually beating the index actually goes down uh, and then the past performers actually don't become the future positive, uh, better performer. So in a sense, most people think that they generate positive alpha, but they actually generate a negative alpha. That's the reality. And they have an illusion that they are generating a positive alpha um, because, because it's an illusion, right? And we just saw there are 10 faults that are listed above uh, which which tells us that hey there is no there's no possibility of a positive alpha very very rare even if it is that means you have to overcome those 10, 10 big areas so then what are some of the strategies that people use today for active sophisticated fund managers what do they use today to generate positive alpha so assume that you know this is rare but let's look at if it's rare like how, what is what do people do today, right? So uh, people today have the small caps, um, size effects, they play the size effects, or they play the book value effect, or they play the momentum effect. So these are three different market beating strategies. One being that if you invest in small caps, they typically have a higher beta and they also have a higher return. And so they, they beat long, large cap stocks. So basically what people do is they take money from, uh, they short, large caps and then they go long on small caps so meaning they invest more in smaller companies and they they actually uh, generate return by building expertise in figuring out which small companies are good then there are these uh 
positive alpha opportunities in value stocks where there is higher book value to market cap ratio. So people uh, go long on value stocks, which is higher book value to market cap and short on growth stocks. So they, which has lower book value to market cap. So they move money from lower book value to market cap companies to higher book value to market cap companies. So that's book value based strategy. And then there's momentum strategy. If, if, a, if a company or a stock starts to uh, appreciate in the last one year, it's gone up, that means it's gonna continue to go up because there's some positive news being built. So momentum as volume increases, as stock price increases, people tend to capitalize on that. Um, if this these three things are true and if these three things actually work, and I think there's a high probability, that means that markets actually are not efficient, meaning that uh, not all companies are on the capital asset uh, uh, line. And that means that there could be market proxy error, there could be behavioral biases that we saw earlier, and that there could be alternate preferences to risk, meaning people don't just look at variance and return, they probably want a much higher return for a very high variance. So there could be so many implications that are important. And finally, the last topic is uh, people tend to also look at uh, this multiple factor model as a risk. So instead of using CAPM, they look at multi-factor, they look at dividend discount model. There's multiple ways in which you can calculate cost of capital uh, or cost of equity. And people tend to combine them. Like for example, expected return from CAPM is typically like this, risk-free rate plus beta, expected return minus risk risk-free rate. But you can now have a weighted average of uh, various types of factors. Like the first factor could be a small minus uh, big, which we saw, take money from big companies, put it in small companies. So that could be one factor of your uh, portfolio. Then you combine that with a company where you, you go from low book value to market value to high book value, so high minus low uh, portfolio and then you combine that with momentum's play. So if you combine each of these, then you get like a weighted average kind of a multi-factor uh, attempt of portfolio that you can create. So while this is in practice, while this is available, but most people actually just use CAPM because of its simplicity and how resilient it is. And most of the results also tend to uh, look very similar, even if you use multi-factor model. Um, and there's lots of uh, uh, complexity, as you can imagine, for building such portfolios. So sticking to CAPM, even though it's uh, it has some of these downside, even though uh, it has uh, it doesn't it doesn't uh, factor in like the positive alpha opportunities. The fact that it's simple and resilient, there's lots of benefits of using CAPM for now. But you can also use dividend discount model, and you can use multi-factor models for uh, finding out cost of capital.